welcome you today to our panel discussion on the future of United States-Japan security relations, given the most uh, uh, three security documents issued by the Japanese government uh, last December. And we will have our discussion, uh, panel discussion starts at 6 p.m., but like I thought it would be nice before we get started to uh, introduce the program, its activities, and also to listen to Dean Fritzmeier, uh, who is going to speak uh, uh, about the geopolitical uh, situation given the recent developments in, in Russia, Ukraine, and how can that be impactful on uh, uh, Japan and United States. Uh, but let me first introduce Professor Aaron Schneider. Uh, Aaron is uh, director of the Institute for Comparative and Regional uh, Studies here at Corbell. And uh, he is mainly working on areas related to political economy. And he recently published a book uh, on China, Latin America, and the global economy. And he's currently working on another project exploring uh, the booms and busts uh, in Brazilian and Indian uh, development and democracy. So uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Schneider. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. Um, uh, it, it's really special for me to participate tonight in this uh, U.S.-Japan uh, cooperation uh, project, something that, that we're very proud of in the Institute for Comparative and, and Regional Studies. I want to acknowledge the folks that made tonight possible, beginning with professors like uh, Ahmed Ab Abdraboum, who's, direct, who's the director of our, our U.S.-Japan diplomacy program, members of our panel, uh, Dean, Dean Mayer, uh, the members of the panel, some of whom who are online, Professor Kanahara, uh, and we have here with us Professor Sun and Professor Isozaki. Uh, and I, of course, owe a great deal of gratitude to our consular official, uh, Maiko Ishizaki, who has made uh, today possible in, ma in many ways. Uh, we can give an, an applause to, to Maiko. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, she has shepherded this project over the last few years, especially working very closely with another of my colleagues who's online, uh, Professor Floyd Cerulli, who guided this, this project um, uh, up, till, up till now. Um, I want to recognize others, especially the custodians and the servers who have brought us this uh, wonderful meal and all the hardworking folks who make uh, events on the fifth floor possible, uh, including my program manager, Saraf. Uh, thank you so much for for all you do to, to keep ICROSS running. And I want to end my acknowledgments with the recognition that uh, the Cheyenne and Arapaho nations were the original stewards of the land on which DU sits. And ending with a land acknowledgement is perhaps appropriate to an event on Japan's new national security strategy, as indigenous knowledge is all about relations. Native American knowledge systems were relational. They took entities like people, and societies and nature to be in relation to each other, such that one can't understand an individual or a society or a forest or a mountain on its own. They are, uh, uh, their most important characteristics become clear only when we put entities in relation to each other. Uh, to make sense of Japan's new national security strategy and US-Japan security relations, we should also pay attention to relationships and ask questions about those relationships. Our relations among countries to be amicable, in which all parties to the relation view each other, uh, pursuing positive sum outcomes. Japanese thinking about its region has long taken such a positive sum relational perspective. Uh, the theory of industrial development developed in Japan of the flying geese was articulated by Kanami Akamatsu, uh, suggested that a lead goose pulls along trailing geese, and the trailing geese in turn push forward the leader. The identity of the lead goose and the trailing goose is not actually important. What's important is that there's a relationship between them uh, in which their interaction produces positive sum outcomes for all. As we think about the East Asian region today, there are multiple relations in which a new national security, relation, uh, security strategy operates. It includes relationships in which the history is difficult, such as Japanese relations with North and South Korea. Further, Japanese relationships with with Taiwan and China, 
both have historical and contemporary dimensions in which positive some outcomes are difficult. Uh, still, relations in East Asia were well described by one of my professors in grad school at UC Berkeley, Lowell Dittmer. Uh, Lowell Dittmer provided a critical insight. What he observed was that sometimes where bilateral relations are difficult, even acrimonious, uh, they can be turned to become stable, even amicable when turned into triangular relationships. And so we think about the US and Japan and China as a triangular relationship, there are difficult relations between the US and China, between Japan and China. An obvious outcome might be to presume that a new national security strategy teams up two corners of the triangle, Japan and the US against the third. Yet rather than subordinate to US zero sum competition, Japan could alternatively take on a role of pivot in the triangle in which Japan has a critical advantage. Japan gets along better with the US and relatively better with China than the US and China get along with each other. This position means that Japan can be a pivotal player in turning what are difficult bilateral relations into positive sum triangular relations. Now, I make no predictions, and I even confess to being somewhat pessimistic about the current moment. But we're here tonight with an opportunity to discuss, to understand, to analyze, and my hope is that the outcome can be a positive sum relation for all. So thank you very much, and I will turn it over now to Floyd Cerulli. Thanks. So uh, I guess we should expect uh, Mr. Uh, Floyd Cerulli to join us online. Uh, Floyd uh, has been the formal director of the program for the last uh, three years. And he's also the director of the Crossley Center for Public Opinion Research at the University of Denver's uh, Joseph Corbell School of International Studies. Floyd, are you online? Yes, I guess you are. Online. Perfect. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ahmed and uh, Aaron, uh, for your months of uh, diligent uh, effort to uh, get this uh, program uh, underway. Uh, as uh, Ahmed just uh, referenced, uh, the U.S.-Japan uh, diplomacy program uh, really is a continuation of a program uh, begun by the Crosley Center uh, for Public Opinion Research and the Corbell School uh, in uh, 2019. And with the help of Zoom, it survived the pandemic and continued to bring uh, professors here uh, uh, to, uh, and join Corbell professors and uh, other US experts. Uh, needless to say, the, uh, the topics have changed a great deal over these four years. Uh, they've evolved. Uh, uh, when we first started, we were talking about uh, the relationship uh, with uh, uh, the Trump administration, uh, how uh, it was uh, changing many of the uh, alliance uh, relationships, um, and uh, it had a new uh, national security look to it, feel to it. Uh, and then uh, suddenly we were dealing with the, uh, the Biden administration um, in, uh, in 21 uh, and uh, Prime Minister Suga. Uh, so that we had a new personnel and a new administration. Uh, we talked a great deal about the Quad. Uh, that was uh, one of our uh, opening uh, topics because it really started uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, the Biden administration uh, really pushed it uh, uh, tremendously at, at the beginning of uh, its, uh, right after its inauguration, frankly. Uh, and now, uh, as uh, was referenced by Aaron, uh, last year we talked a great deal about uh, the impact of the uh, Ukraine war, uh, about the uh, apparent rising tension um, and uh, more aggressiveness of, uh, of China uh, at that per, uh, point in time. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Professor Kandahara, uh, so good to see him uh, again, uh, was uh, one uh, on one of our important panels uh, last year uh, talking about the, uh, the Korean relationship. Uh, so that will be a, a, a very uh, interesting uh, sideline. And what we talked about uh, were uh, the beginnings. You could see the changes that were taking place in Japan's uh, national security uh, strategy, its budget strategy on defense. Um, and now under the uh, Kushida administration, uh, uh, the, uh, it is really coming to fruition. And so these are going to be uh, rich topics uh, for the uh, next uh, few panels uh, that have been organized uh, starting tonight. 
Uh, I do believe this is the year of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I don't think uh, that uh, while there's much going on, obviously, in Europe and a lot of danger, uh, I think this is still uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific is the place uh, where there's going to be a, a so much uh, 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 both opportunity, but, uh, but also a great deal of tension. I just took a quick look at the Wall Street Journal for the last uh, uh, two or three days. Uh, U.S. set to boost its true presence in Taiwan. These are just headlines, front page headlines. Uh, she plans uh, Moscow visit as Putin wages war. Uh, U.S. eyes detailing Beijing potential arms aid uh, to Russia. And finally, uh, the West's NATO alliance uh, has been renewed. Uh, I would argue that almost all the alliances that the West is, uh, has, uh, in, in, including all the, uh, the Asian alliances, uh, have been um, uh, strengthened and renewed. And the, uh, the reference that uh, Aaron had to uh, 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 America's uh, being able to work with uh, a number of these in, uh, organ uh, countries, whether it's uh, South Korea, the Philippines, Taiwan, uh, Australia, have all uh, sort of renewed the, uh, the uh, alliance uh, uh, influence. So I would close with that this is a uh, really a sort of a legacy program of the uh, uh, Crosley Center and the Corbell School. We're very pleased that the school and the Dean uh, have uh, adopted it and taken it on uh, and uh, really are they're enhancing it and doing a, uh, I, I think a, a tremendous job. I believe everybody will uh, get a great deal uh, out of it. Uh, I would uh, uh, just uh, second uh, uh, Aaron's uh, comments that uh, uh, thanking the uh, Consul General uh, and his staff for their uh, incredible assistance uh, in keeping this program uh, going. Uh, so with that, uh, Ahmed, I, I hand it back to you. Uh, thanks, Lloyd. And now it's the time to have our keynote speaker, uh, Dean Fritz Meyer, please. I guess we need this to go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, well, uh, many thanks uh, to my colleagues, um, to the Consul General staff, Mayuko, uh, to our distinguished panelists who are joining us. Uh, Thank you uh, all for being here this evening. It's really a, a, a great thing to see uh, our students, uh, familiar faces, friends from the community, uh, friends from the Denver Council on Foreign Relations who are joining us this evening. Um, so uh, my job here is to uh, say a few words and then get out of the way when uh, to allow the, the real experts probably to, to talk. But it, um, uh, you know, I, I do want to say just a, a you know a few things about this moment. Um, I was reflecting, thinking about it, um, uh, my own experience in dealing and uh, in, in engaging with U.S.-Japanese relations really has come full circle. I uh, uh, I, I started out um, uh, when I was a grad student. I was working with a man named Ezra Vogel, uh, who wrote a book entitled "Japan Is Number One." I worked with Ezra Vogel and, and a guy named Robert Reich, Bob Reich, who, who later was Secretary of Labor. And I was, and at that time, uh, we viewed uh, Japan as a mix of envy and rivalry. Japan was the ascendant economy. We were frightened of competition from Japan. We were sort of envious of the just in time Kanban system. Uh, we were studying uh, uh, that. And, and, uh, trade issues, Japan was really at the forefront in a way of American foreign policy. I later worked, uh, I worked for two different members of Congress. I worked for a congressman from uh, Michigan, Sandy Levin, wonderful man. Uh, Sandy was uh, uh, the first op-ed I ever wrote that under, it was published in the New York, New York Times uh, under his name, not mine, uh, was basically calling for, for trade sanctions against Japan. <laughs> <laughs> because of the unfair competition and demanding that uh, Japan open up to American beef exports. And, uh, and then a few years later, I found myself working for Bill Bradley, so the senator from New Jersey, and um, it fell to, fell to me to uh, shepherd the NAFTA agreement through the Congress at the staff level. I ran that effort. Uh, public opinion was um, at best divided. Uh, 
it was a very hot button issue. This is ancient history. For those of you students, uh, this is before you were born. So uh, bear with me. Some of the other people whose hair is the same color as mine will remember this. But uh, in, the, in 1993, NAFTA became the hottest issue. Obviously, it didn't directly involve Japan, Canada, US, Mexico agreement. But to sell the agreement, the Business Roundtable commissioned a man named Lee Iacocca to do a commercial. So Lee Iacocca, for those who don't know, was the former chair of Chrysler Corporation. He was sort of a hero of American business because he had gone toe to toe with the Japanese audio industry and done well. And so he was the face of an ad that the Business Roundtable ran that uh, basically, I would see if I can get this right. It basically said, we need to conclude this deal with Mexico because if we don't, Japan will. And at that time, that was thought to be a very effective uh, campaign uh, uh, thing. So, uh, and then uh, I was working for Bill Bradley, as I mentioned, and Bradley actually uh, became quite expert on uh, Japan. So his college roommate was a, a man named uh, Dan Okimoto, who headed the um, uh, center at, at Stanford. And Bradley actually learned a great deal. Every year they brought young uh, rising political leaders and others to Stanford for sessions. Uh, some of that were off in me, as you as you can see, not much of it. But um, uh, Bradley was very, very knowledgeable. And, and uh, when uh, Walter Mondale, who I, I think of as the other Fritz, uh, for those of you know, um, so he was Fritz Mondale, anyway, uh, he was nominated to be ambassador to Japan, he came to visit uh, Bill Bradley. And Mondale really didn't know much about Japan. So he came, he had a little pad of paper with him. And, and he, he said, Bill, you know, what do I need to know? And two hours later, he's still writing. It's just, Bradley walked him through all, you know, the parties, the polarizing people think he ought to know, relations with Korea, I mean, on and on and on and on. So that's, whatever it is I know, I know from, from that. Um, but, you know, the odd thing is that for a period of time, Japan receded, at least in the public view, from being the central issue of, or a central issue in American foreign policy. And what you saw, of course, was a rise of, of China in many ways, uh, both as importance in real terms, but also in our imagination as a, as a lot of focus on China. I, I might have had a little hand in that too. We were instrumental in uh, the process that created the WTO, that got China into the WTO. There was a, a lot of optimism in those days that the uh, being part of a liberal trade order would also mean uh, a certain things in politics. In any event, China became the new Japan. Uh, in American politics, China became the threat, the thing, uh, the country that was taking our jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And I think Japan sort of receded in importance, um, at least in perceived importance, uh, in our foreign policy and probably got a great deal less attention uh, than it deserved uh, for a period of time. Well, that was then, and this is now. Uh, uh, Japan's back uh, for, um, for many, many reasons. Of course, it never went away. The Japanese-US relationship is deep and thick in so many ways in terms of the economics in particular, uh, but also cultural relations and a host of other things. But this last year, well, either, you know, it, we've been leading up to this for, for a while, but what we've seen, and what's become clear really post invasion of Ukraine are forces that were already underway uh, uh, before that. Um, it's really, I think of it as a tectonic shift, a shift of the plate in, in, in the world. And in that shift, Japan emerges as, uh, as one of my colleagues said, I think Aaron said, a, you know, really pivotal player, really pivotal player. And uh, we're, you know, that was probably always true but it's not really obviously true. And that has all kinds of impl implications. I'll just, you know, in, 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 in what is happening now in the Pacific Rim in, in, it is, is not unlike what happened in uh, Europe post-invasion. So what you saw, of course, Putin imagined that he would invade Ukraine and, and, and the West would crumble, far from it. Uh, as, um, as Madeleine Albright predicted the day before the invasion, the West rallied, it strengthened NATO, it strengthened the resolve of Europe. Germany 
altered its long policies on, 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 on in the military realm, uh, as did others. Uh, and what you see is a strengthened NATO. And in fact, if NATO enlargement was the concern, that was a really bad move, move by Putin because you see uh, Finland and Sweden uh, at least attempting to be a part of, uh, of NATO. A similar dynamic, I see a similar dynamic in Asia uh, where, yes, uh, China had been a rival for a period of time, but it, it, there's now a kind of urgency uh, and that is driving uh, uh, action elsewhere. I think Floyd mentioned the uh, military systems to Taiwan, the Philippine bases you know, that, that we're seeing now. Um, uh, and not trivially, uh, what is happening in Japan. Uh, so I'm sure you all know Japan's uh, defense posture has been uh, purely defensive and still is in many ways. Uh, uh, limiting, I think, uh, total expen expenditures in military to 1% historically. Um, but you see in the new uh, security uh, strategy uh, a move, at least you know, not trivial, uh, still defensive, but uh, uh, now uh, able to have what is called counter-strike capabilities, um, which uh, are to be used as counter-strike by policy, but have the capacity to be offensive weapons. Um, and now moving from one to 2%, the sort of agreed upon norm in, um, uh, among allies in terms of uh, defense posture. So you're seeing Japan uh, in that document increasingly alarmed by what it sees in both China, but not just China, Russia, Japan's neighbor in both, uh, is really affecting, uh, as best I can tell, and I await the comments of, of people who know a lot more than me, is really affecting uh, Japan. So what you're seeing is uh, in, in, the, in, you know, with, with AUKUS, with the, with the agreement with Australia, with the Philippines, with, uh, you know, what's happening in Taiwan, the, the sense of threat uh, in Asia is e ever so much heightened. Uh, that was true before the invasion of Ukraine, but there's there's something deeply unsettling about that. Um, and the reason, and coming back to my tectonic plate metaphor, that I think Japan ultimately is so pivotal and therefore the U.S.-Japan relationship so important, is that what you're seeing now, and we'll see how deep it goes, is a strengthening of the alliance uh, between the U.S. and Europe in lots of ways, and Japan and Australia. Uh, and at the same moment, you're seeing this uh, dalliance, uh, this relationship between China and Russia. How deep that goes is still an open question. China has to hedge its bets in some ways, and I don't want to overstate that. And it's easy to caricature the world as sort of auto autocracies versus democracies. That's a that's, that's a, there's, there's some truth to that, but there's also a danger in oversimplifying. But nonetheless, you are seeing the contours of uh, what amounts to a new second Cold War. I mean, there's sort of a, a alignment of, of forces in the world. We'll see where that goes, but in that world, and especially obviously in the Indo-Pacific, you know, Japan is, is absolutely a central and pivotal player and will be for the foreseeable future. There are a lot of uncertainties uh, about uh, where we're going uh, uh, in the world, uh, ranging from, frankly, will the U.S., where, how stable is U.S. policy? Uh, you're seeing a softening of support now, the New York Times headline, I think, today, softening of support for uh, U.S. measures in Ukraine. Um, uh, the jury is out on how long, you know, whether the same phenomenon happens in uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, I guess the obvious point, the biggest uncertainty now, maybe we touch on this, is 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 what happens with Taiwan, uh, uh, and what and how do we, you know, hopefully deter some, uh, 
aggression, uh, China's aggression, uh, but if not, how do we respond? Um, where will the global system land in terms of the ultimately the prevalence of the norms that have governed the world uh, to some extent, at least, and uh, rule of law, uh, laws of war, uh, the basic premises of the UN are being called into question. Um, and then I think fundamentally, there's this question of where, what the what the fundamental geopolitics uh, uh, will will end up, what that what that geometry looks like um, uh, five years hence. Uh, one thing that we can be sure of is that uh, Japan and U.S.-Japanese relations are going to be pivotal, important, and more salient than they've been in uh, probably a generation. So. Uh, thanks for hearing me out. Uh, I look forward to, uh, thank you very much for being here this evening. Um, it should be a, a, a really uh, intriguing, interesting, and important conversation. So uh, I look forward to it. Thank you all very much. So uh, I just want to get sure if uh, if Saraf can confirm that if Professor Kanehara already online, is he online? I just need to get sure he is. He is, okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, so good morning, uh, Professor Kanehara. Good evening, everyone. Good morning. Um, um, actually in December last year, uh, Japan was described as uh, running a revolution for its security policy. And this is simply because Japan has issued three different documents related to its security, defense, and even foreign policy. Uh, the first is a new national security uh, strategy, and it's called new because the first one was in 2013, and there is a debate about what's new about this new one. Uh, that we will definitely discuss it. Uh, the second document uh, is known as a national defense strategy. And the third and the last one is a defense build-up program. Uh, these documents have sparked headlines and reactions from different uh, uh, East Asian countries, namely uh, China and North Korea, uh, accusing the Japan of abandoning pacifism and uh, committing to its largest military build-up since the Second World War. Um, however, do these new documents truly re represent a turning point for Japanese security policies? What is the background of these policies? Uh, what are uh, the reactions or how these policies were perceived both inside and outside Japan? Are but some of the very few questions that I'm going to ask uh, to uh, our distinguished panelists today. And let me very briefly introduce our distinguished panelists before I open the discussion. Today, we are joined from Japan uh, by Professor uh, Nobukatsu Kanehara. Uh, he is a professor at Dushisha University in Kyoto, uh, political science department. And Professor Kanehara served as assistant chief cabinet secretary to prime minister, uh, to the, the late prime minister Shinzo Abe from 2012 to 2019. And in 2013, Mr. Kanehara also became the inaugural deputy secretary general of the National Security Secretariat, a role which he held until his retirement from uh, the government service in 2019. He also served as a deputy director of the cabinet intelligence and research office. Uh, Mr. Kanehara's role in the cabinet built on a distinguished career at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where he served in a number of notable positions. These included, but not limited to, the Director General of Bureau of International Law, uh, Deputy Director General of the Foreign Policy Bureau, Ambassador in Charge of the United Nations and Human Rights. He also served uh, abroad as Deputy Chief of Mission in Seoul, uh, Republic of Korea and political minister at the Embassy of Japan in Washington, D.C. And he was decorated by the President of the Republic of France with, and excuse my French, 
la order de la Légion de Honneur. I'm sorry if you speak French and I bother you by my pronunciation. Um, so um, next we have Professor uh, Zheng Sun, and Professor Sun is a professor in the Department of Political Science here at the University of Denver. His areas of expertise are Japanese politics, Chinese politics, and East Asian international relations. He is the author of two books. The first one is Japan and China as Charm Rivals and Soft Power in Regional, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, short, short power in, Soft Power in Regional Diplomacy and Red Chamber Worldly Dream, Actors, Audience, and Agendas in Chinese Foreign Policy. Both published by the University of Michigan Press. His articles have appeared in uh, Current History, Asia Affairs, Journal of Contemporary Chinese Studies, Japanese Studies, International Journal of Communication, The Diplomat, among others. He also served as a research fellow at the University of Tokyo, Waseda University, and the Japan Foundation. Uh, last but not least, visiting us from DC today, uh, we have Mr. Uh, Kome Isozaki, uh, who is a Japanese a Japan Chair Fellow at Hardison Institute, and he is an expert in Japanese defense policy, space security, and biological and chemical weapons conventions. His research areas include space policy and defense strategy, with a focus on the Asia Pacific region. And he has also a deep knowledge of intelligence operations and foreign policy of Tokugawa shogunate uh, era in the early modern times. Uh, from 2018 to 2022, Mr. Isozaki was a senior director for business integration and partner coordination of the Tokyo Organization Committee for the Olympic and Paralympic Games. And from 2016 to 2018, he was a director of the Biological and Chemical Weapon Conventions Office of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. Mr. Uh, Isozaki was also a visiting fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies from uh, 2005 to 2006, and again from 2012 to 2014. He previously served in the Ministry of Defense of Japan for over 20 years. His posts included work on space policy, cyber policy, strategic dialogue, intelligence, and peacekeeping uh, operations. And he served as a policy advisor to the commander of the Northern Army between 2010 and uh, 2012. So please join me uh, in welcoming our distinguished panelists today. And um, let me just kick the discussion by a very general question to three of you. And my question is, can you please just comment very briefly on these three documents and give our audience a sense of what do they mean for Japan and for East Asia and also for the US-Japan relations. And let me, if you allow me, let me start from Professor Kanehara. The floor is yours, Professor Kanehara. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Denver University, Kobel. And thank you, Floyd. Thank you, Michael-san. Uh, can, can, I, can I speak five minutes? Yeah, sure. Yeah, do, do you hear me, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Let me start with the national security strategy. Our Japan's interest is best served in this liberal order. And liberal order means we have universal values, love, conscience, freedom, and rule of law. And this liberal order is built on the global scale towards only towards the end of the last century. We had overcome two world wars, racism, colonization, dictatorship, oppression of minorities. And this order is precious and we, everybody in this order must contribute to sustain this order. And this must expand into global south. Our challenges are one, of course we have, we have war in the brutal war in Ukraine, we have finished this with a victory, but we have after, beyond that, we see rising China. And China is a bit different from our values and they don't share values. We do share some interest global global climate change and some commercial values, but they do not share our, our values. So we have to cope with it. Now China is 75% of the US in terms of economy and the military budget is now rising very rapidly, five times more than Japan. And they oppressed the freedom in Hong Kong 
and there are problems with the Tibets, Uyghurs, and the Inner Mongolians. Now they are ta they are targeting us, Taiwan. And but I have to say Chinese Chinese rise is not forever. Their population has started to shrink already this year. They are ten years younger than Japanese, but ten years older than Indians, and their people are awakened. They are protesting against the severe lockdown of COVID against Xi Jinping. It's amazing to see that youngsters in the in, in China, outside China, are, are showing the white paper saying that Xi Jinping should go. This never happened before. So we have to be, we have to be prepared for the change of China. And you, the West, if United, the greatest contribution of the US this time in the Ukrainian war is that the United States again realize the unity of the West. When the West is unified, the West is two times bigger than China in terms of economy. Comprehensive power of the West can defeat Putin in Ukrainian war. And we can we can maybe wait for China without causing any trouble on the part of the Chinese on Taiwan. And the if the if the West is united, we can still sustain this global liberal order. And we can finish this war in Ukraine, and we, maybe we could lead China to a right path. And for us, for the West, the victory over China is not containment of China. We can live together with them. The victory of the West over China means the democracy in China. It will not happen very soon, but we have to wait maybe five decades or maybe one century. But this is the only way for, for the West to win over China. Let me turn to Japan US alliance. The, this is a cornerstone of the of the peace and stability in Asia. In 1960, Prime Minister Kishin and President Eisenhower agreed that the Americans can use Japanese bases to keep peace in Korean Peninsula, Taiwan Islands, and the Philippines. These are ex-Japanese empire or ex-US colonies. But US said, the, let, let us use the Japanese bases. And we have to, I mean, the US will and have to has to uh, protect these these new, newly born countries and South Korea, Republic of China, and the Philippines. This was agreement 1960. And 1999, after the Cold War is over, Pre uh, President Clinton and Prime Minister Obuchi said there could be a war in Korean Peninsula again, simply because North Koreans are developing nuclear weapons. The US is imposing very heavy sanctions upon North Korea. In that case, what Japan should do? Should do? Obuchi said, Although our constitution prohibits us to engage any war, but if if bad wars happens in the vicinity of Japan, Obuchi said Japan would engage our forces in non-combat operations to help US forces. This is the new agreement of 1999. 2001, after 9-11, when the NATO was mobilized to attack the Al-Qaeda Taliban in Afghanistan because they saw the US was attacked by the Severe Terrorism Act, this was the, the breach of peace in the terms of the chapter seven of the United Nations Charter. This was decided by the UN Security Council. And then the Prime Minister Obuchi said to President Bush, Japan will engage five warships in the operations in Indian Ocean. Japan's fleet, five warships, was the second biggest fleet in the Indian Ocean in 2001. So Obuchi, engaged our forces in non-combat operation. That means we could not launch cruise missiles, we could not launch our bombers, but we helped Americans to do that by, by giving the fuel in the middle of the Indian Ocean. This was non-combat operation cooperation for the first time. And the 2015 Prime Minister Abe said that the, it's not enough if Americans soldiers are risking their lives for the peace and stability in Asia. Why shouldn't we help them? And he changed the constitution uh, interpretation and he said Japan would be in the from the first place together with Americans in the combat operations. This is what Abe did in uh, 2015. Now let me turn to national defense strategy. Then what shall we, what shall we do? The Kishita-san said, but our capability is not enough. So he said we have to double the military budget. This is 1% of GNP now. This is half of the NATO standard. And Kishida said, we have to catch up with the NATO standard as a principal ally of the United States in Asia. And if we double our military budget, Japanese military budget is not small. It's the size of the UK, France, or Germany. 
if Japan doubles its military budget, it's only uh, only after US and China. It's, it could be more than Russia, than India, than Saudi Arabia. This is what's going to happen in coming five years. And the uh, ten years ago, when Abbasan started to to think about the Asian situation uh, in the, in the, in a realist way, Abbasan started to move our focus from the north, Russia, towards the south, Taiwan, and it's now still continuing. And what Mr. Kishasan is doing that is just beefing up our strategy, and it's coming to reality now. And the biggest issue is the counteroffensive capabilities. The China has 2,000 missiles that can reach Japan. Some are nuclear. Americans are zero, because American had, was, was bound by INF Treaty until recently. And this missile gap is huge. Conventional, conventional uh, capability of China is very big. 350 warships in the region. Americans have only 300 globally. Japan has 50. We can, we can even, we cannot even match the Chinese fleet now today, and this is the reality today. And so we have to make a big efforts. And biggest thing is the missiles. We have, we have zero. Americans have zero. China has two thousand. So Kishasan said, if we don't prepare for ourselves, we can be attacked instantly when Americans start to launch their bombers from Japanese bases. That's the reason why Kishasan said we have to be prepared for acquiring the counteroffensive capabilities to show that. We can deter China. If China attacks us, we should back. And the Kisasan says it's reported that the government is now buying only 400 tomahawks. It's not enough at all. It's a peanut. China has 2,000. So we have to be prepared. We have to, be, we have to show that the, we have some deterrence capabilities in the conventional terms. And what we are lacking today completely is the cyber. Cyber capabilities are very bad in cyber. We have to make big efforts in cyber and space too. Space ten years ago, Abesan said we have to start the uh, space space cap space uh, space operations. Now I, I believe that our air force will change their names, Aero Space Self Defense Forces soon. And now the space situation awareness is now being constructed, but we have to go into much deeper to keep up with the Americans, Chinese, Russians, and other European allies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let me turn to Professor Zheng Song. If you can also comment on how did you see the three documents? Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, let me first start by thanking Ahmed and Aaron for your hard work in uh, making this event possible. And Mr. Suzaki and Professor Kanahara, I'm looking forward to learning more from you. Uh, my understanding is uh, the theme of tonight's panel discussion is to discuss Japan's new national security strategy in the context of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So maybe it is worth worthwhile to, at the very, very beginning of, of my remarks, to clarify the geographical distance between Ukraine and Japan. And Ukraine is about 5,100 miles away from Japan. But of course, what is happening in Ukraine is carrying strong implications to Japan and to its neighbors in Asia Pacific. And Japan and its allies are looking at the war in Europe closely, but so are Japan's challenges as well. The Prime Minister of Japan, uh, Fumio Kishida, said explicitly in May 2022 that today's Ukraine could be tomorrow's Asia. And the war in Ukraine is not a fire on the other side of the river that Japan can afford to ignore. So one way to look at the war in Ukraine is to think of it as a combination of two grand competitions, the competition of capabilities and the competition of narratives. So these two grand competitions will not just be unique to Ukraine, but also will be applicable to future conflicts elsewhere. Uh, now on the comp competition of capabilities so far, what do we have? We have Ukraine that has managed to surprise the world by holding off Russian advances, even managing to retake territories grabbed by Russia at the onset of the war. Now, with Western supplies of arms and with its strong will to fight, Ukraine has defied the odds and has dashed the myth of Russian invincibility. Now, cutting to the chase, what can Japan and its allies learn from the Ukrainian endurance? 
For in Asia, the elephant in the room is China and its expensive and increasingly credible threats to take Taiwan, all of the South China Sea, the Senkaku Islands, among others. So to deter Beijing's growing list of threats, Japan needs to acquire credible deterrence capabilities. And a major change in Japan's new national security strategy is to assert its counterattack capabilities. And that is to attack missile-related sites in the attacking country. So consider this as Tokyo's not so subtle warning to Beijing and to Pyongyang that Japan will fight back. And the Japanese revenge will be carried to the attacker's home turf. Now the second lesson Ukraine's war uh, has to off offer is the importance of alliance. China is indeed a vast, aggressive, and bitter superpower. What China lacks though, is friends, except to pariahs, North Korea and Russia. Now China is no Russia and the Chinese military capabilities look more advanced on paper, but looks could be deceiving. The People's Liberation Army has not been tested in the battlefield for more than three decades. And as the latest bizarre spy balloon incident implies, that Beijing may have a serious problem uh, in terms of building an, uh, an if smooth internal communication mechanism between its civilian and the military branches of the government. The war in Ukraine may also be understood as a clash of colliding narratives. Ukraine's desire of firmly orienting the country to the West and Russia's irredentist claim of reincorporating land it perceived as lost in the past. Now, both narratives are remarkably relevant to, to East Asia, with Japan firmly identifying itself as a member of the West for well over 100 years. And now we have a democratically robust Taiwan that is building a viable bonds, value-based bonds with countries in Europe, in North America, and the Oceania. But let's not forget China's opposing but equally powerful narrative the narrative of retaking Taiwan and using it as a closure to the so-called century of humiliation. Japan's new national security strategy no longer attempts to sugarcoat the Chinese threat. Instead, it calls China as Japan's unprecedented and the greatest strategic challenge. Now, in return, China's propaganda machine, its infamous Global Times, has resorted to publicly shaming Japan as America's running dog. So the gloves are off. In Ukraine and quite possibly in Asia, the competition of capabilities and the competition of narratives. Now these two grand competitions are now joining forces, creating a very volatile region with ever increasing adrenaline rushes among major players. So in this grand rivalry, Japan has already made its choice of which side to join. Its new national security strategy is a major effort of enhancing Japan's capabilities and revising its post-war pacifist narratives as a way to ensure that Japan will be ready for an increasingly fraught era. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Isozaki. Thank you, Professor Brado and the uh, Cobell School for inviting me and uh, giving me an opportunity to visit Colorado for the first first time in my life. And uh, <laughs> it's a nice view. I hope you enjoy. Yes, and a great audience. Uh, thank you very much for sharing this uh, panel with uh, Professor Sun and uh, Professor Kanehara. Um, so uh, I think I, I have no objection to these two uh, panelists. And, uh, and also I recognize I shouldn't repeat the same thing and so, uh, as the uh, professor mentioned, that uh, I'm an expert, so-called expert on uh, some Tokugawa, Tokugawa shogunate. So I can, I could begin from the history, but history, but uh, it, it could be too long. So for this <laughs> occasion, so I can mention that uh, arguably these three strategic documents released last December is uh, most fundamental change of Japan's defense policy since World War II. Um, the answer is yes and no. So there is always historical consistencies in Japanese uh, foreign policy or defense policy or any other policies. Because Japan 
uh, emphasizes the consistencies in, uh, in uh, explaining every policies. So we emphasize the uh, consistencies. So, uh, for example, and Japan's na uh, national security strategy was first uh, published in uh, 2013 under the name of national security strategy. But it was, of course, it existed even before the publication of the policies. For example, in a 19, uh, 50, 1957, Japan's Japanese government defense council published a uh, basic policy on defense. I think this is the origins of the modern, uh, modern times or um, contemporary Japanese security policies. And they said, uh, this is very succinct, uh, very short, but I think it's a very good uh, policies uh, characterizes Japan's situation at the times. So first is to supporting United Nations activities and coordinate differences international, uh, national uh, many countries and eventually um, achieve world peace. Second is to stabilize uh, civil societies and raise uh, patriotism and prepare the foundations for the national securities. The third is to uh, maintain and uh, gradually increase defense capabilities uh, for, the, for the exclusive purpose of the self-defense. The fourth is in case of uh, external aggressions, uh, until United Nations take effective measures, uh, US and uh, Japan will cooperate with the United States to based on the security cooperation. This is the four principles and envisioned in the 1957. Uh, so this will be developed in uh, 2013. Uh, it's real, um, this is abolished. This was abolished uh, when the new first national security strategy document came out in 2013. Um, but I, I think I can mention this is the uh, lasted in a 50, more than 70 years. Uh, so this is a very uh, um, basic policy and this still is uh, still valid. And then uh, looking back the self-defense policy histories in 1950s, uh, Special Police Reserve was uh, established under the uh, under the command or under the request of General MacArthur, which occupied, which is head of the uh, uh, occupying U.S. forces in Japan. Japan was not still uh, independent. And this is a period. This is a kind of uh, ancestor of the Japan's current self defense forces. And in 1951, next year, uh, San, San Francisco Peace Treaty was signed and which became effective in 1952. And in 1953, uh, two uh, defense laws were passed, enacted. Uh, this is a self-defense uh, forces law and the establishment defense agency law. So defense agency is a formal body of the Japanese Ministry of Defense. Uh, so, so defense agencies uh, has a long history. So when I entered about 30 less years ago, it was still called defense agency. This, the, the status of the agency is a uh, little bit lower than the other ministries. So defense agencies or safety defense forces were regarded um, inferior to other government functions. <coughs> so um, also over the, during the Cold War, so we were preparing for the potential attack and invasion by the Soviet unions. And so under this, uh, situations and also under the detente period in 1970s, in 1976, first defense program guideline was uh, created. So this is uh, first uh, defense strategy published, and this is based on, of course, year by year, uh, uh, almost five year uh, national defense program uh, build up plans was accumulated into the strategies in 1976. This created a fun. Uh, it is a fundamental concept for basic defense capabilities. So this concept is basically for Japan should become a vacuum in the international areas. If Japan becomes vacuums, the other country will take those part in uh, practically communist powers in, the, in on the mainland China, also Soviet unions could be pushing back, pushing toward in, in the Japanese areas. This is because Japanese archipelago is located in in the uh, Pacific Rim. So without passing the allusions, uh, Japanese archipelago, the Philippines, Soviet navies or Chinese navies or submarines couldn't go to the Pacific Ocean. So this is geographically important concept. 
And so uh, two, uh, two years later, in 1978, uh, first US-Japan Defense Cooperation Guidelines was uh, drafted. So this is targeted against the Soviet Union, but uh, this is the origins of the US-Japan, a formal kind of defense operational concept, operational plan of joint uh, capabilities. And in 1995, so reflecting the end of the Cold War, uh, Japan uh, first time uh, revised the de National Defense Program guidelines. Um, also, uh, two years later, in 1997, uh, U.S.-Japan Defense Cooperation Guidelines was revised also. So this, uh, having in mind North Korean crisis uh, a year before, and also situations in areas surrounding Japan, these concepts were introduced into Japanese uh, defense policies. So these are very controversial because a lot of diet sessions going on, whether Taiwan Strait was uh, included or not. And uh, Japan, Japanese government didn't really answered. Uh, they didn't exclude, they didn't say it's included. So the uh, this is, although they use the word of situations in areas surrounding Japan, but, but the government explained this is not the geographical concept. This is a kind of scale of gravities. If space, scale of gravity reaches certain point, Japan will work with United States forces, uh, mainly in the rear area operations, logistic support to the U.S. operation. This is the first U.S. Uh, Japanese uh, uh, defense strategy and beyond the exclusive self-defense policies. And uh, also this is the e era, and uh, the first uh, Taiwanese democratic election was held. And the, the uh, second or third, I forgot the numbers of the uh, Taiwan Strait crisis occurred. So Chinese People's Liberation Army set it some areas surrounding Taiwan to for the missile exercises which we have seen the last year, last summer. Uh, but this is the first case of the missile launching around the areas of, of Taiwan. So um, so some years passed uh, in 2000, 2004, defense program guideline was uh, revised again. So this equated international terrorism. It's, it's after the 9-11 attack and Japan's uh, kind of special operations uh, uh, in the Gulf War and also uh, some of the uh, operations in, uh, uh, in Iraq. So international terrorism and the missile defense, also uh, some of the Japanese defense shift from the deterrence to response. Of course, deterrence is still important. And in 2010, so this is under the Japan's uh, Democratic Party of Japan's, uh, they issued a uh, uh, defense program guidelines. And so they introduced the uh, first uh, dynamic uh, defense concept of uh, mobile defense capabilities. So this is considered from shift from the basic uh, <coughs> defense capability concept where Japan should become a vacuum to Japan should respond more mobile and agile defense capabilities. And uh, three years later, so Liberal Democratic Party is back and they issued a new new defense program guidelines in 2013. So the uh, previous one lasted only three years. Uh, so this is 2013 is important uh, because this is coincides with the issue of the national security strategy. So some of the national defense program guidelines policies or some of the parts were removed and because we kind of transferred to the national security strategy documents. So this, based on national security strategies, so national defense program guidelines, although the name is the same, uh, some of the nature has changed from, uh, from just a defense capability to general uh, foreign policy issues to more specific operational uh, strategy is introduced. So they, uh, they consider the national security environment becomes more and more severe, and the U.S. Uh, pivot, U.S. rebalance into Asia occurred. Also, we have to incorporate our lessons learned during the uh, uh, great earthquake of East uh, East Japan in the 20, uh, 2011. Um, so these area, uh, these periods, uh, we have discussed a lot of uh, operational issues. Also, uh, transferring some defense equipment, Japanese defense equipment, to to abroad. So these are uh, becoming more and more necessary for the Japanese operations or Japan's defense industries to enable uh, more internationalize their 
productions or, or, or sharing the uh, equipment with uh, partners and allies. And um, so those are, those are histories. Uh, so looking at the, those uh, dif uh, national defense program guidelines and national security strategies, so that was uh, explained when they issued. It was uh, 10 years in the future. At least this strategy was, was planned to continue 10 years, but it has never, oh, it never lasted 10 years. Um, three years to five years, uh, we replaced uh, these strategies. And so in 2022, we uh, issued the national security strategy, defense strategies. So now the naming is changed from defense program guidelines to defense strategies. Also, uh, midterm defense plan became national defense buildup plan. So naming also uh, shifted. Also, nature has slightly shifted. And it's important that the attachment to uh, annex, annex documents to uh, national defense uh, buildup plan is a 10-year plan and a five-year plan together. So we, ha we can see, foresee uh, what Japan was going to do in, in the procurement or how to be uh, changing the uh, force post uh, postures. And um, so these changes occurred uh, uh, based on the international internationalizations to self-defense forces. Also, uh, as the Dean mentioned, the Japan's uh, role is, is, um, is shifted, uh, reflected. So we are not revolutionary. Japan never had a revolution in history. We major restoration, we store something as before. So those documents are always consistency, or, but uh, are always very responsive to the, what is going on uh, internationally. Okay. So Thank we're you. not we're not witnessing a revolution, as no it revolutions. was described. Okay. Yes. Reform. <laughs> Reform. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> And uh, actually, let me get back to Professor Kanehara. Uh, I know, Professor Kanehara, you've been working very closely with uh, the late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe for many years. And so if I may ask you kindly to uh, just explain the atmosphere and the environment within the cabinet back then, and also the decision-making process that led to the two or the, to the three documents that we have right now. Uh, I understand that Prime Minister Kishida uh, back then was also serving in different capacities as a Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, I guess briefly as a Minister of Defense as well. So uh, would you kindly comment on the decision-making process that led us to this moment? Hello, me? Yeah, Professor Kanehara, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, decision-making process, um, this the, 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 the national, secu national security strategy has, was written only 10 years ago. This is the very first one. I, 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 was, I was there. And uh, as the Professor Isozaki said, the, we had, we had no, no strategy simply because the Japan was a peculiar member of the West. Dr. Kishinja wrote in his book, World Order, Japan was in theory in the West, but Japan was not in the struggle of ideology of the Cold War. It was so true. What I mean is this, the, Kishida, the Yoshida Prime Minister and the Kishi, the chose the Western side, Alliance of the United States. But unlike the case of Germany, Japan was not divided as a nation, but Japan's parliament was completely divided. This is very different from Germany. And we had very strong communists and socialists in, in the parliament, and they were in the East. So we could not have a national consensus of national strategy. Government chose the West, but parliament was divided. This is our case. So we could not come up with the coherent national security strategy simply because we could not get, get approval of, of the diet. And the, in 1970s, unfortunately, we had a wrong decision saying that the Japan shall, simply Japan shall have only the bare minimum of military forces not to create a vacuum in the region. That means, and that was the, that was the ba basis of the argument of 1% of GNP military budget. That means beyond 1% military budget, we don't defend ourselves. Soviet is far stronger than that. So we have to be dependent upon the United States. This was called after the United, after, afterwards by the United States, the free rider Japan. 
and to abandon this, it took decades and decades. And only 10 years ago, Abesan said, no, we have to have a strategy. 30 years ago, Cold War is over. There's no longer a social spot in Japan. We have to come up with that. Then Abesan Abe uh, shows the national security strategy 10 years ago. And since then, we have, we have been, we've been beefing up this strategy. And this time, for the first time, the uh, Kishida-san said, we have to have a national defense strategy. Americans have national security strategy, national defense strategy, and national, the military strategy, yeah, right? And this is the first time that we have these strategy, strategies. Military strategy is incorporated into the national defense strategy in our case. So this is the first time that the logical strategic concepts to back up our uh, military budget for the first time. So this was decision making, decision making. I have to stress that the, the national security strategy was written by the National Security Council. Again, this is 10 years ago, only 10 years ago that Abe-san uh, established national security strategy. And so this, this organization is instrumental. And now the boss, the national security advisor is Mr. Akiba. He worked, he sweated very much to frustrate the prime minister and we have to beef up more than Mr. Abe. We have to go for it. And they made, he made a big leap here with the approval of Prime Minister Kishida. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I want to turn to Professor Jing and um, um, I'm quoting here from the Korean Central, North Korean Central News Agency uh, that of course criticized uh, the document, the national security strategy and by saying that Japan has in fact adopted a new security strategy formulating the position of the capability of preemptive attack on other countries, thus bringing a serious security crisis to the Korean Peninsula and East Asia. Uh, Global Times, uh, which is very close to the Chinese Communist Party, uh, also commented in a very similar way saying that uh, Japan has a history of straying into militarism and committing aggression and crimes against humanity, which has brought disaster to the region and to the world, and is now deviating from the track of post-war peaceful development. How, how do you see, Professor, how do you see developments in East Asia, especially if we focus on Japan-China bilateral relations? given this new document that also given the, I don't want to call it aggressive reaction from Japan, but like definitely they seem very upset. Well, in the wake of the, the publication of the, this new national security strategy, China and North Korea are the two countries that are the loudest in terms of voicing their displeasure. Uh, I think this, this really should surprise no one. That's, uh, and even in terms of the tactic, uh, the Global Times and is its and the People's Daily are really repeating this their time-tested tactic of framing this as a revival of Japanese militarism and are not really doing this to try to persuade any other countries to accept. This is really for internal indoctrination to try to continue to justify China's hawkish position towards uh, towards uh, Japan by striking a strong emotional chord with the Chinese people by emphasizing. Uh, historical grievances. So there's there's really uh, nothing uh, new there. But what's in, what's new to me though is I remember when I was a research fellow at the University of Tokyo around 2007, 2008. Those were during the better days of of you know trilateral relations uh, among America, Japan, and China. And at the time, the Japanese Prime Minister was uh, uh, Hatoyama, uh, who is a social democrat. And one of his major agendas was to build an East Asia community. Right? He was, and I remember I was interviewing this Japanese diplomat, and he was he kept uh, saying, you know, Japanese people, Chinese people, Koreans, we're in the same boat. And he kept using this, you know, we're in the same boat metaphor. Well, uh, you know, fast forwarding to to 15 years later, we're still in the same boat. But the the problem is one of the sailors, the biggest one, is wants to rock the boat. So. Uh, when that happens, uh, mayhem will, will occur one way or another. Disability will happen. Uh, what to me is, is worrisome is there was a time 
that China actually wanted to somehow isolate China-Japan relations as some sort of a standalone entity to try to create some space to uh, pull Japan further away from the American orbit and closer away to the Chinese orbit to, to try to function, to, to make China-Japan relations function according to its own logic, if you will. I think that area is gone. And, and President Xi Jinping is now very clear that, that he sees America and Japan as a coherent whole. And what's particularly the worrisome, but also interesting for scholars is the attitude of South Korea. Because just a few days ago, uh, South Korea's new president, uh, Yim Sook Yeol, he actually made a speech on the national independence day. This is usually the day that South Korean leadership would actually emphasize uh, their heroic struggle against Japanese colonization. But this time is, is utterly different. Uh, president Yoon actually praised Japan for evolving from a military aggressor 100 years ago into a peaceful democratic, democratic partnership that shares universal values. With, with Japan. So of course, in the eyes of Beijing, this is particularly disturbing because we have not just Japan and America joining forces, and you'll have South Korea that seem to have a peak side as well. So what this means is as President Xi is preparing for his end game with the US, and when I use the term end game, I scared my students a lot. <laughs> he was thinking about displacing America. But as he was thinking about preparing for this, uh, you know, final showdown with, with America. He is seeing Japan and South Korea, and increasingly South Korea as well, as inevitably, uh, inevitably a part of his grand strategy of displacing America as well. So to me, that's the most disturbing uh, development in East Asia. Very interesting. And um, Mr. Isuzaki, you said that there is no revolution as it was described by uh, some analysts but like, is it fair enough to say that Japan or these documents are signaling a departure from the very old approach of Japan being a very pacifist nation? Is that a departure from this pacifism? It's a little departure. So I, I wouldn't say Japan wouldn't change at all, but Japan is always responsive to the nature, uh, to the environment. So Japan is uh, slightly departing from the pacifist nature, but the pacifist sentiment is too strong. But of course, uh, uh, the the public seems to be undivided right now. As uh, Professor Kanes mentioned, 1960s and 1970s, uh, the socialism and communist forces in Japan was really strong, but we don't see that force right now. And even compared to the 10 years ago, uh, when the Japanese uh, Prime Minister Abe now uh, made a, a new uh, security legislation that enabled the reinterpreting the Article 9 of the Constitution that, that involves uh, um, exercise of a collective self-defense, which was a little still uh, some protests occurred during the diet buildings. But this time, the capabilities could be expanded revolutionary, maybe, and also defense budget doubled and the permanent joint headquarters will be established, but there is no protest in Japan. So in, in that sense, uh, of course, conservative forces, uh, prime minister was uh, unfortunately assassinated last July, but uh, his spirit and his strategy remained very strong. Uh, so I now realize he, he is not voicing himself, but he's reflecting the public sentiment and that sentiment still go on, continues. Uh, perfect. So uh, let me get back to Professor Kanehara. And uh, just, I, I want to stay uh, within Japan. I mean, focusing on the Japanese domestic political spectrum, responding to such kind of new developments. Now I learned from Mr. Isuzaki that, you know, issues that has, have been polarizing the Japanese uh, political spectrum. Seems like now the political atmosphere in Japan is more quiet. Uh, my understanding also is the public opinion in Japan is in favor of, of these changes. But I want to ask you about the Japanese uh, Liberal Democratic Party itself. Uh, you know, the long ruling political body of, of Japan, at least since 1955. Uh, how do you see these documents uh, reacting, uh, impacting the factions within the Liberal Democratic Party. Is that 
uh, if I may, is that a victory for the conservative factions within a conservative liberal democratic party? I, I guess uh, we need to. I, yeah. I have to say that the the governments and the Liberal Democratic Party and Komeito ruling party, the Buddhist Pacifist Party, they are all supporting these three documents uh, simply because the national mood has changed drastically. I have to say the, the general feeling in Japan is we are far, far closer to China and Russia and North Korea. Americans are far away. <laughs> and I have to say that the, the sense of insecurity is now huge. And Russia is a European nation in the end. Siberia, it's a huge vacuum. North Korea is lethal. They have nuclear weapons and they are threatening us, launching missiles every, every month. But it's a tiny nation. China is a huge nation, almost the size of the United States. And they are now targeting at Taiwan. And this sense is now real. The huge sense of, the, I have said, the sense of insecurity spread very widely, especially after the President Biden invited Prime Minister Suga. And we talked about Taiwan, Japan, and the United States in 1969. It was Kissinger, it was the President Nixon and the Prime Minister Sato. And since, since then, half a century, we didn't talk about Taiwan. When President Biden raised this issue to us, and then the, it's the, the sense of insecurity exploded in Japan. Oh, it's coming. And now the whole faction, Davish, Hawkish, Liberal and Conservative, everybody, even including the very much pacifist party, Komeito, they are now supporting these three documents. I have said there's some, some generational changes too. The, in Japan, senior people closer to the end of the war is more pacifist and more liberal. But liberal, it's too much to say. They are more inclined to support the Eastern side during the Cold War. Labor Union and the, the activists of students, they are very much Marxist. And they are now in their 70s, 80s. And the have the youngsters are very different. Youngsters are pure individualistic and the sort of the American liberals. American liberals. They're different from the sort of uh, our our liberals, 1960s, 70s. They are they are very much inclined toward the, toward the eastern side. And the young, youngsters in Japan are very much liberal too. They are liberal, and they are but they are liberal in the American sense, and they are individualistic. They hate totalitarianism. And they are, they, they are, they are, they are realist. Up to 1991, when Soviet Union was there, although the position is very different, the, the those who stood with East had their logical, logical, logical thinking because Japan should abandon the alliance. Japan should be the weak militarily. Japan should not oppose the Soviet Union. But their position was logical as far as they believed the Soviet Union was right. After Soviet collapse, 1991, 30 years passed. Now it's it's meaningless to say Japan should abandon the alliance. Japan should not have the big military forces. And now they, they are now worried about the Ukrainian war, aggression by Russia, and Chinese rise, military build up, and Taiwan war, and North Korean nuclear weapons. So atmosphere is very, very different now. And I believe that these three documents have strong support from the public. Thank you. And let's move to the United States and uh, to Professor uh, Jing. Um, on January 13, uh, the Secretary of State, Blinken, Secretary of Defense, uh, Austin, uh, the, uh, Japan's Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, Mr. Hayashi, and the Minister of Defense, uh, Mr. Hamada, uh, they met uh, convening what, what what is called U.S.-Japan Security Consultative Committee, SCC, in Washington, D.C., and they seemed all in harmony, and they, there seemed like in the United States, there is a real understanding to why Japan is moving into this direction. So would you kindly comment a little bit on how do you see these documents contributing to maybe consolidating or strengthening the U.S.-Japan security relations? How can also the United States help Japan to achieve uh, 
the, the goals uh, set in these documents. United States has a very long history of trying to push Japan in the direction actually Japan right now is heading for. Mm -hmm. uh, one could even argue this would go all the way back to the Korean War. And now this is a, a, a tad ironical because right after the end of the World War II, uh, it was under General Douglas MacArthur that America imposed demilitarized, demilitarization and democratization. But very quickly what happened was the start of the Cold War, China went red, in the Korean War. So one may argue that very quickly that uh, the that Washington came to regret the decision of, of defanging Japan or demilitarizing Japan. So uh, we have Democrats and Republicans, just uh, consultative presidents have been trying to push Japan to become more assertive. Uh, what has changed lately as uh, Professor Kanahara and also Mr. Isozaki mentioned is, is on the Japanese side. There is definitely still pacifism, but at the same time, as Professor Kanahara mentioned, the general mood has changed in Japan. Uh, I actually just checked the latest um, survey done by NHK, Japan's national broadcaster, before uh, tonight's panel discussion. And it looks like you had 45% of the Japanese people were in favor of revising this pacifist constitution you have 19% that still want the continuation, no change to the constitution. And then you have a large ambivalent middle, which is around 30%, 39%, uh, 40% of the people that don't really have a clear position. But for the people who do have a clear position, clearly the people who want to revise the constitution is on the rise. And it also depends on how, you know, for the survey questions, how those questions are framed. If there's no, you know, a, like ambivalent choice, and all of a sudden you have a clear majority of the people that are in favor of revising the constitution vis-a-vis -vis the people who still want to maintain uh, the status quo. So again, I think what really happens, so what's happening in Japan is certainly a welcoming uh, development to the US. Um, Mr. Isuzaki, maybe same question, since you live yeah. in DC now, and I'm sure you're very close to the, you know, the, the decision-making environment here, uh, also Harrison Institute, like what is the atmosphere in Washington, D.C.? Uh, very welcoming, mm -hmm. because as uh, Professor Jim man, uh, so mentioned that uh, these, uh, most of the uh, new kind of directions are for long, kind of a long time overdue. The United States government, uh, a long time, or maybe more than 30 or 40 years are pushing Japan to do these measures, increasing defense budget, uh, counter, uh, counter uh, strike capabilities or uh, uh, supported by the United States. And uh, may I touch upon some of sure, domestic sure. Yeah, please do. Yes, um, so Professor Kanihara mentioned, so I want to say something about domestic. Yeah, so not many reported in Japanese or U.S. medias in the national security strategies are Japanese domestic measures. So they write about a lot of uh, lack of capability in Japan about cooperation between the uh, Maritime Self-Defense Forces and the Japanese Coast Guards. Of course, this uh, cooperation accelerated in the past 10 years since the ch Chinese intrusion into the Senkaku Islands areas. But uh, there's a sense of more coordination is necessary and also use of um, civilian uh, airport and the port facilities, other public infrastructures should be uh, more linked with um, in response to uh, national defense or big uh, earthquake, those are operations uh, uh, require those infrastructure will be e e effectively used by the Japanese forces and the US forces. And we have seen in 2011, uh, so civilian ports, uh, they have a labor unions, which is connected to the socialists. They have been long history of opposing any use of uh, their facilities by the self defense forces. But because of the 2011th earthquake, they uh, realized they have to allow the self defense forces use the civilian ports and airports. So there's a more necessity of resiliencies of Japan, not just the port and the facilities uh, roads, but also uh, some of the like ammunition and fuels uh, stock is not enough. Of course, I cannot say clearly how many days, how many weeks we can fight over because it would be national secret, but it, we cannot fight over 
uh, year. It's impossible. So we need to, there's a sense of urgency of more emissions, more fuel stocks are necessary. So we have to uh, build a new uh, facilities to for the stocks. Also, we need to um, kind of dual use, co-develop, and then effectively use each other about the civilian capabilities, including uh, fuels and uh, those uh, stocks. And also the some hu human personnel, personnel parts, uh, they, they recommend it, uh, they will not recommend, they are uh, decided to do about personnel capabilities. So the educations uh, of those um, academics, industries and government should cooperate in a security studies. And so also uh, necessity to in the government officials and self defense forces uh, officers should have a more uh, professional education in a new field like a cyber space or AIs, uh, quantums, those new areas, uh, uh, Japanese governments or even the militaries are not very uh, <coughs> uh, familiar with. So those are areas we need to do, uh, do more education, so more uh, cooperation with uh, civilian communities. Thank you. Uh uh, to be honest, I still have many questions, but I guess it's fair enough to uh, engage our dear guests in the discussions as well. So uh, let me open the floor for any question or comment. I, I would just kindly ask you to uh, mention your name and your affiliation, and if possible, just try to make your comment or uh, uh, question as, as brief as possible, uh, Professor Haider. And I guess we should have a mic being passing over. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I certainly have learned a lot uh, uh, from these uh, learned uh, analysts and commentators, uh, um, and uh, uh, we could be more deeply engaged historically, to be sure. Uh, um, so I will ask two questions. Uh, uh, one of them really has to do with the kind of nitty gritties that uh, uh, Suzaki-san was uh, <laughs> telling us about. Uh, let me push a little bit farther. Um, how will Japan create a genuine military industrial complex based largely in Japan? Uh, what are the most difficult obstacles? Will Japan try to become a nuclear weapons capable power? How will Japan create a combined operations capable military with a 21st century C4 ISR and MDPW, that is multi-domain precision warfare functionality? The second question is more historical, uh, uh, but from a realist perspective, there are many kinds of realism. I'm trying to create a new kind of realism. Uh, um, if you're interested, I'll send you my papers. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, can this be interpreted, and I'm trying to be provocative uh, here, uh, as the unstated part of Yoshida doctrine? Uh, um, Yoshida sensei, I think, was a very clever, very deep thinking, very brave. Uh, uh, especially in the context of uh, defeat of Japan and occupation of Japan. I have the highest respect for him. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, once, uh, Miyazawa sensei, uh, who was then the finance minister, and I was lucky to, to be asked to advise him about Asian Monetary Fund in particular, but we would have sake together in Akasaka, and <laughs> he would discuss things. And once, uh, uh, and Japanese say that, you know, when you are in sake, you, you open your heart. Uh, so uh, uh, I uh, remember, and I was shocked at first, that actually uh, Yoshida Sensei uh, had the position that, uh, uh, you know, instead of, uh, you know, Fukuku Kyohei, they should give up the Kyohei part uh, for the, for that, but not permanently. Uh, as uh, Japan becomes a Fukuku once again, uh, naturally, uh, for a realist, uh, uh, it will be, have strong military. Uh, so, uh, are we now, now seeing that part of unstated, uh, maybe it was just Harage, uh, uh, part of Yoshida doctrine, which is never mentioned. Uh, so let me just put it in that way, uh, be a little provocative uh, uh, in history. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. That, that's an important part. And then uh, I'm not really expert on that, but uh, I, I read some, um, What's um, the negotiation between uh, Prime Minister Yoshida and the GHQ at the time? 
And also, I, I remember that Yoshida san, uh, um, Prime Minister uh, Yoshida Sensei <laughs> said that uh, until Japan reaches a certain point, Japan should limit military capabilities. Yeah, that's true. But so called Yoshida doctrine is Japan is just a pacifist, only economy, no military. So, the Yoshida doctrine is, I think, misinterpreted. Yoshida san real intent. Also, that taken advantage, taken advantage of by the communist or socialist in Japan, which has a strong influence on Japanese academics. That's my comment on the Yoshida-san's part and the military industrial complex. Uh, so these are the part I didn't mention, but uh, this uh, national new national security strategy has a, a long part of uh, defense. Uh, industrial base and defense uh, technological base. But they have a lot of uh, uh, parts of sh written about the defense cap industries and technologies. So those are, I think, in the uh, 1960s or 70s, Japan's defense capability was really strong because of the World War II. They have a lot of uh, uh, already developed capability Japan took advantage of. But in the last 30 years, that declined a lot. A lot of Japanese small, uh, particularly small corporation, decided to withdraw from the defense section, defense sectors. And then, so those are, uh, all the Japanese government or national defense program, program guidelines previously mentioned uh, defense industry is important, but they didn't really get any budget or any new legislation to support those industries or encourage them, the new companies to join in the defense sector. Now they have a budget funding. Also, I heard it was submitted two weeks ago to the diet based on the new strategies, how to fund or how to Japanese government even purchase or own some of the production facilities from the private, private companies in necessary and they let them to just operate. The government own those uh, some of the factories, for example, the submarine factories or big ship factories, so government government could could purchase from the private companies. So those are new initiatives are taken. I'm not sure if these measures will be really effective to encourage uh, new Japanese industry will grow. Um, but the another point of the nuclear weapons capability is this is a kind of a existing pacifism. Japanese public, because of the, our uh, tragic memories of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we have a strong uh, anti-nuclear weapons sentiment with this. So unlike Republic Korea, who recently president even mentioned Korea should have uh, nuclear capabilities, Japanese have a um, lot of concerns about China and the North Korea's nuclear power, but we, uh, our uh, Japanese public considers that is importance of U.S.-Japan alliance, importance of extended deterrence, not we are going to have our own nuclear weapons. And uh, also let me remind our panelists that you can, if you, even if the question is not directed to you, you can, you can still, of course, uh, comment or, uh, or add to uh, the answers that uh, have been already uh, mentioned. Uh, any other question or comment? Yeah, please. So we need to go, yeah. Thank you very much um, for your time and your insights this evening. My name is Kyle Schultz. I'm a first year graduate student studying international security. Last week, we had a similar panel with guests from South Korea, um, and I posed these questions to them. The first being, do you believe that it is time for a more formalized multilateral security partnership in the Indo-Pacific, similar to a NATO? Uh, and then the second is, if there were to be a change in US policy towards Taiwan and officially recognizing their sovereignty, what do you believe uh, the response of Japan would be? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, Professor Kanehara, do you want to, to take this one? Uh, thank you very much. The, um, it, it, I, I believe that the American Pacific Alliance system is far, far sadly weaker than NATO. We don't have organization, secretariat, one single command, and we don't have the uh, nuclear powers like UK or France and great army in 
in Germany, great fleet in Italy and Spain, and big army in Turkey. NATO is far stronger than the American alliance system in the Pacific. American alliance system in the Pacific is called, is called hub and spoke. Hub is the United States. Spokes are Japan, South Korea, and Philippines, and Thailand, and the Australia. This is all the US have in the US has in the Pacific region. It's not at all enough to deter China from attacking Taiwan. And this is our, our, our situation. Wish very much that we could have a strong, robust regional organization, but I have to say it's not very easy at all, simply because our threat perception is very different from country to country. Japan is, as I said, the US alliance system is, Japan is the rear base to defend Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines. This is Article, Article 6 of Japan-US Security Treaty, uh, devised in 1960 between Eisenhower and Kishi. And this is where we are. So we have to pay attention to Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines. And we have somehow, somehow in Vietnam. Australia is far away, but they are together with us, watching us broadly. But South Korea is, has to focus upon North Korea, Taiwan, China. And the Philippines in a very important location, but I have to say we don't have a very strong uh, military consultation with them. And Thailand is, is far away, and their, their perception of threat is very difficult, very different. So the, very frankly, the, it, is, it is not at all easy. That's the reason why we are making the small, mini, uh, minilateral things like Quad, like AUKUS. And free and open in the Pacific is a networking on the Diplomatic, diplomatic domain, militarily, our uh, structure is still very weak. So we have to strengthen this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I agree with uh, Professor Kanihara and also for NATO's. Uh, if, you, if you look at the map and the Asia Pacific region which is so diverse, so big, Europe is very small. It's smaller than Chinese. So and that's a geographical difference. Also, um, so uh, it's important to have a bilateral, uh, each US bilateral alliance should be, have uh, some cooperation for like a trilateral quadrate. So, so those kind of uh, uh, activity is now increasing. That's, I think it's a very positive. Yeah. And I'll do, I'll do my best to accommodate all, all questions, yeah. Can you please use a mic? Yeah. Thank you. I'm Carol Hildebrand from Sherman and Howard and also from the Denver Council on Foreign Relations. I practice immigration law in a commercial law firm. I'm curious how the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is what I heard about in my career, and then the change when the US was out, and I think one now exists, but how that overlays on all this military thinking. Okay. Yeah, sure, please. Yeah, uh, the, we have to talk about three things to sustain this liberal order in Asia. Of course, we have to talk about the values. This is a precious one for us. And second, the military structure. But third, we have to, we have to make sure that Asians are, Asians are convinced that they are more prosperous with us. And for that purpose, the free trade is very important. We're very sorry that the US left this TPP framework, but but I have to say the big seat there is open. It's all US is always welcome, but it's very difficult now with the uh, Democrats and Republicans both. The Congress is Congress. The atmosphere is very different, but it is still open. I have to say the free market, free trade system is very important. This is not a system to make rich people richer. Not, not on the contrary, the investment flows down where wages are, wages are cheaper and the labor force is excellent. It was, it was China for, for some time. It was ASEAN nations, Japan, and then the three, four tigers in 1980s. It was Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Korea. Taiwan, Korea became now very big. Korea is now size of G7. Taiwan is now size of G20. And it was successful. And then the money went down to Southeast Asia and then now it's 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 flooded into China. Now it's now spilling over to Vietnam and India, and it goes down. So the the precursors industrializations industry is hallowed. We are suffering from it, right? But Americans were very much they showed ingenuity to open the new domain of internet. GAFA is dominates. 
the internet business now, right? They're far bigger than the petroleum countries now. And this is how we have to survive. But for that purpose, free trade must be kept open. We're very happy that Americans are back with IPEF. But IPEF, the trade party is now omitted. But you have to make, we have to make friends in Asia because Asia is now gaining 60% of world production this century. We have to expand our liberal system into Asia. For that purpose, we have to engage them. To engage them, the best way is, of course, to guarantee their security, but we have to show them that free trade is open to them. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, since I guess we, we still have many questions and given the time limits, uh, what if we just go, if you allow me, dear panelists, what if we just go by rounds? Uh, would that be okay? So like two or three questions and then we turn back to you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so I remember living in Japan when North Korea fired a missile over Hokkaido and I remember seeing the Japanese reaction to that. I think in our culture, we kind of leave North Korea as kind of the butt of our jokes. We don't take it as seriously as a security concern as, say, the Japanese population does. So I guess my question is in terms of uh, Japanese foreign policy strategy, which does Japan see as a bigger security threat to the region, North Korea or China? <laughs> Thank you. Let's, let's, yeah, let's have two more questions. Yeah, here, here we go. Same, same table, yeah. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm a... Uh, uh senior undergraduate international studies major. Um, so I know that President, President Xi uh, has informed the PLA uh, to be ready to invade Taiwan by 2027. Um, I want to know how much weight you think the Japanese government actually puts behind that sentiment or statement. And OK, yeah, let's have a third and last question for this round. Hi. Uh <clears throat> I am uh, Luke. I am a first-year undergraduate uh, student at Corbell. Uh, I was curious about how uh, Japan and also a lot of the other East Asian nations plan to balance the twin challenges of a rapidly aging population because, and also national defense. Because in a lot of ways, uh, those are tw two competing ways where all of these nations need to like allocate resources and, and other things like that. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, let's get to uh, DC questions first, and uh, let's see if we have more. Uh, Professor Jing, yeah, go ahead. Um, in, in terms of uh, the, the level of Japanese sensitivity to North Korea versus China, um, the way that I see this is North Korea is a huge annoyance, but China is the real big deal. So, and especially even when you think about North Korea, the fact is China is really North Korea's uh, security sponsor. And China is the country that, that offers 90% of the petroleum imports to North Korea. So without a Chinese support, North Korean regime would collapse very quickly. So it's, it's really uh, the long-term credible threat definitely is from China. And you know, one of the uh, uh, people in the audience earlier asked the question of what if America recognizes Taiwan as a sovereign state and how will Japan follow suit? Well, um, probably a more relevant question to ask is, America will only recognize Taiwan if it really, really wants to have a war with China. Because it is not about how Japan will follow suit. In the wake of a possible American recognition of Taiwanese sovereignty, the, a more plausible question is to ask when the bombs will start to fly. Because that's really the bottom line for Beijing, it's a very thick red line that no country. So what it is actually in Taiwan's interest, in English we have a phrase, don't bite off more than you can chew. So it is actually in Taiwan's interest, and America I think is on the same page, and Japan is on the same page, is to maintain a comprehensive relationship with Taiwan, just short of calling it official. So it's unofficial in name only, in every meaningful way, it's official that we see Taiwan as, as an alliance partner, short of recognizing its sovereignty, because the moment that does is the moment that war will happen. Any other? Professor Kanehara? Thank you. I, I fully concur. 90% China, 10% North Korea. Maybe that is the proportion of our threat perception. 
And the P PLA, um, I have to say, that's the now Japan is now building up very quickly uh, our military forces again, simply because now China is now very big. And by 2027, 2027, 2030, uh, I, I don't say they will attack for sure Taiwan. I don't say that, but they, they could be capable. They could not win very easily. Maybe they cannot win, but they can very easily start a war. Now they are capable of not winning, but they are capable of starting a war very easily. We can deter them free. So they are capable that by, by 2030, that is the reality. We have to be prepared for that. We have to be able to dissuade them. Don't do that. We do share interests, peace, stability, commerce, and not the climate change. And if they if they start that, they devastate Japan and Taiwan, but they'll be devastated too under economic sanctions, maybe under military attack. So we should we should stop them. And this is a, this is truly real. Um, Xi Jinping is he's he's regressive. He's very narrow, and it, it was possible to persuade maybe Fu Jintao and Li Keqiang, uh, Fu Junhua, Fu Junhua. But I don't believe that the Xi Jinping is, is very narrow. He's focusing on on Taiwan and his government is not. Third one is very dangerous because nobody can say no to him. It's only yes man uh, around him. So uh, we have to make sure that the, it's not the easy war, don't start it. And the, uh, uh, what's the last question was what? Um, I'm sorry for that. Luke, uh, can, can, you, can you repeat your question again? Yeah, can you hold on? Uh, where's mine? Yeah. Duke? Uh, Luke. Uh, Luke, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so I was more curious about like, because with, we're talking about the fence, um, like having a rap, like most of the, like not just Japan, but South, South Korea and Taiwan are dealing with a rapidly aging population. Oh, uh, aging population. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, and like how does, how, like how does Japan and all Japan plan to balance the, both of those, uh, like the problem of needing to, uh, uh, expand its defense capabilities while also dealing with the, you know, aging crisis, because both of those are very, for various reasons, competing problems. Like you can't really remilitarize with a rap, with a, you know, pop with a population that has like average age in like fifties or above. And like, so how does Japan, yeah. How's your plan, plan to balance this yeah, Okay, uh, we, have, we have two questions here. One is how to cope with the, the decrease of population and how to how to cope with the uh, res the the could, could be weakened resilience of the military forces, right? And on the military forces, the answer is very clear. We have to use more AI drone robots, and this is everywhere. It's not only in Japan. You know, it's the same thing. China, not it, it's it's the same for everybody. We can't let boys die in the battlefield. Ukrainian was 19th century war. Russians are powering in the less trained people for just being killed there. We can't do this. The future battlefield is the battlefield totally controlled by AI robots and drones are fighting against each other. So this is a future battlefield. And I think every modern army is headed for that direction uh, because less and less kids are entering military forces and we can't, we can't, we can't lose their, their, their lives very easily. And second is the more broadly, how to cope with the decline of the population. This is a huge problem for us. And uh, this year, amazingly, Japan's newly born babies are less than 800,000. This is major time, major time, 100 years ago. We're going back there. And we are losing more than 1.3 or 4 million people. Uh, they, they die just naturally. And the, so how, how to do this? My government's position is very clear. Uh, we have to, we have to, of course, help girls and boys to have more babies, but we have to open up our labor markets. We have now 2.5 million foreign workers in Japan. Um, Prime Minister Abe decided to expand this number more. Um, diversity is coming, that's fine. That's enrich our, our culture, civilization. And Germany, for example, they have less smaller size than Japan. They, they are a bit smaller size in, in economy in, in, compared with Japan, but they have they have 10, 10 million foreign workers inside Germany. And that is the European case. Americans are, Americans are inviting 2 million foreign workers every year, right? And now we have to do the same thing. And the, now we are, we were before COVID, the, we were 
we were expecting 50,000 50, foreign workers every year. Abbasan decided to expand this. Before COVID, just before COVID, we are, we, we are inviting 80,000 foreign workers every year. And after COVID, I, I believe that this number will still increase, maybe 100,000 every year. And this is where we are headed for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Isuzaki, maybe, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sure. I should be quick. Uh, first question about, uh, I, I can say the North Korea was the founding fathers of Japan's defense strategy from 1995 to early 2000. Now China is the founding fathers of Japan's defense strategy from 2005, 6 to now. And the second question about um, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, order of uh, preparing to Taiwan attack by 2027. Uh, I'm not sure, I can't confirm uh, if this is true, but uh, I think we should be prepared uh, that that could come earlier than 2027 if, if the environment is ready for China. Also, if uh, Taiwan declares independence or US will renounce their uh, one China policy, that could invite invasion before 2027. So we have to be very careful. Third question about population. Yes, I agree with the Professor Kane Harris and the strategy document, national defense with a plan that clearly states uh, for more focus on unmanned vehicles, not, not just the drones, but also uh, surface ships and uh, underwater unmanned. So emphasis on unmanned system AIs, and those are very clear in the documents. So, but we are not there yet. So we are, should ex ex accelerate these trend. Uh, not just domestically, but also with uh, cooperation with allies and partners. And and let me let me use this opportunity uh, speaking about China and and Japan. Given the uh, recent security developments in Japan, let me also invite you next week, uh, uh, exactly same time, five to seven. So actually, we are going to have five to six thirty. It's going to be shorter. Uh, we will have. Um, a lecture on the U.S. I'm sorry about Japan-China uh, relations, given the new development. So it will be much more focused on the bilateral relations of China and and uh, uh, and Japan, and it's going to be downstairs, a uh, first floor as a forum. Um, so we have, I guess, five minutes, and I want to be on time. So maybe this is a last round. If anyone is interested, uh, okay, yeah, please. Uh, in, in this table. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to you. Hello, Hi. my name is Ace Alcantara. I'm a third year undergraduate student in political science. I'm actually in Professor Sun's Politics of Japan class this quarter. Hi, Professor. <laughs> um, I was curious to know because you had mentioned that 45% of the um, general Japanese population being in favor of changing the pacifist constitution, how that would affect relations with other parts of Asia, um, especially US aligned Asian countries like South Korea specifically after World War II and the tensions between those two countries are still very high. Okay, and let's move the mic to the table here, please. And I'll, co I'll come back to the same table, but let's first go here and I'll come back to you. Um, what I'm curious about is during the negotiations that took place and are taking place between Japan and the United States, did Japan ever tell the United States you know, you really should be careful about this, for example, or we don't quite agree with you on that and so on. Were there any areas of disagreement that remain unresolved? And let me get back to the same table and get one last question. Hi, um, yeah, I was wondering like what Japan's um, interest in a U in a U in a Ukrainian victory would be, is it just to establish a global an anti-war norm that will hopefully deter China from invading Taiwan, despite the fact that they've publicly said that Ukraine is not Taiwan, or is it um, for like a larger stru structural reason? Perfect, so uh, yeah. Well, in, in terms of the rising popular support for constitutional amendment, getting rid of Article 9, the pacifistic constitution, um, as Ahmed mentioned, uh, the only two countries that are really vocal in terms of voicing their opposition are China and, and, and North Korea. But even, the, uh, even at this point, I think the Chinese are trying to 
already, you could argue, making peace with the looming fact that Japan will change its constitution. It's just a matter of time before uh, the departure of Article 9. Not to mention it has long been buried in practice, if, if, if not in spirit. So uh, that's really not, it, it, this is, and, and Xi Jinping is preparing for his final showdown, his invasion of Taiwan with, under the assumption that he will be dealing not just with, uh, with America, but also with Japan and, and possibly South Korea as well. Um, yeah, let me let me also give Mr. Isuzaki and Professor Kanahara like uh, just one or two minutes okay. just for, for any kind of like concluding okay. remarks. Uh, about the constitution part and uh, I don't know, have you ever read the Japanese constitution article 9, section 1 or section 2 or any other proposal to revise it? Uh, if, you re if you read those documents, uh, rational people should agree because Japan Japan's constitution says uh, uh, section one prohibits use of force to settle the international international disputes. That part will remain, even any proposal include those those part remain. So nobody could um, argue against it. It's it's very hard. The I think a fundamental maybe change would be the section two prohibits the possession of defense capabilities. <laughs> so nobody could. It's very hard because even North Korea or People's Republic of China they have defense capabilities. How can the constitution prohibit the possession of possible defense capabilities or military capabilities, they say? So we, in government interprets uh, exclusive uh, defense-oriented and the minimum defense force is not, is not the defense capability prohibited by the constitution. <laughs> That's our kind of very tricky interpretation. So those will be kind of settled, but uh, I think a prohibition of uh, use of force will remain. Um, the other part is, um, um, I think Ukraine part I would address. So Japan's uh, interest is is not citing a particular part, but the Japan is trying to uh, uphold the international order, which is the use of force, uh, change, change, changing the status quo, changing the order by use of force is not allowed. So Japan would like to maintain that uh, Rule, rule, international order. Professor Kanehara, any final? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I fully concur with Professor Isozaki. Article 9 was written by the, of course, Americans during the occupation in 1946 and promulgated in 1947. And it's, it's far before the Cold War started, just, just after the, the defeat of Japan. And MacArthur said, you don't have army, navy, and the air force. He did. He, he he wrote that in our constitution. So we we abandon the the use of forces to settle the disputes. Article nine, paragraph one says the all the disputes must be settled by peaceful means. Do not go to war. This is United Union Charter. So we accept that nobody will change this this paragraph one. Paragraph two, Japan shall have no army, navy, air force, and this paragraph is already kajuk. And this, the many youngsters in Japan said, it's a why, why do we have this still? And this, this will be, I think, will be deleted in ten years' time. And the Japan, U.S. The remaining issue is now U.S. is fully supporting us to develop our defense capabilities. It has kept so low now. It will be picked up by, by Kishida-san, and the U.S. Will, will help us a lot. Remaining issue is the operational one. When Japan reaches some level of military capabilities, new capabilities, how Japan and the U.S. Would, should cooperate militarily, and this issue is, this big issue is now out of the table, and we have to revise the Japan-U.S. defense guideline to, defi to define, to, to redefine missions and roles of Japanese forces and U.S. forces. And third is the um, Ukraine war for Japan. And this is one, of course, this is against the United Nations Charter. If we, if we allow Putin to prevail, now no, nobody can believe any longer Western leadership and liberal war, even United Nations Charter. So we have defend this one. Second is the President Biden showed very clearly that when the United, when the West is united, far stronger than any challenges like Russia and China. And if we wish to peace keep in the in, in the on the Taiwan in the Taiwan Strait, the vital precondition is unity of the West, economic sanction, the military power. If the West is in disarray, China can invade Taiwan easily. So we are defending 
international order and we are defending unity of Taiwan. This is for the sorry, unity of the West. And this is to keep peace in Asia, to keep peace stability over Taiwan Strait. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let me, before I end this panel, uh, read Article 9 of the 1946 Constitution of Japan, because I guess it's, uh, it's very telling, like how different Japan is now and, and the different moments that we are in, just very quickly. Article 9 of 1946 Constitution reads, aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the, thre uh, and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes in order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, still I'm reading the article, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other potential, will never be maintained, and the right of uh, belligerency of the state will not be recognized. So uh, you, you can tell that this is totally a different, a different moment 77 years ago. Can you be very quick, please? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I want to say thank you for the invitation to come here and join you this evening. Wonderful topics and uh, excellent presentations. But I want to say a special thank you to the Japanese government and the Japanese people. Tonight we have talked about how the Japanese people can exert themselves more in the area of influence they have. But there was a remarkable thing that happened two weeks ago. A huge earthquake in Turkey and Syria took tens of thousands of lives. One of the first countries to show up and provide assistance was Japan. Um, they reached out immediately, saw the danger from their own challenges in Fukushima and Sendai, and felt that they could reach out with their heart, not in a military way, but in a peaceful way. So as we talk about remilitarization and threats, we also need to keep in mind the association of countries the brotherhood of countries to support life uh, wherever we can find it. So thank you, thank you. very much. OK, thank you very much. Uh, again, Professor Kanihara, uh, Professor uh, Jingson, and Mr. Isozaki, thank you very much for joining us today. Our dear guests, thank you very much for coming. And I, I still hope to see you next week discussing the Japan-China bilateral relations focusing on security. Thank you very much.